Hi everyone. Uh, is everyone doing great today? Are you doing great today? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it's better be good that you're doing great because uh, I have to break the news to you. Uh, my presentation is going to be trying to tell you the truth about mobile apps, right? And a good chunk of the presentation is going to be very depressing. Uh, so on the sunny side, though, uh, the, uh, there are some good things and good learnings I hope you can uh, take from this presentation. And uh, again, the idea is, uh, is to give you the truth, right? So not, uh, you know, do only uh, kind of uh, marketing side of things or whatever. It's just going to be trying to, um, to give you a, a bit of a, uh, a bit of a hands up. Is it moving like this? No, it's moving the other way around, right? Okay. And, uh, and as Anlor was telling you, my, uh, uh, my name is Philippe Dumont. I'm uh, the CEO and co-founder of a company called Aziton, which is uh, a mobile A-B a -B testing and, uh, and personalization platform. And uh, the idea is not to talk about that today, uh, even though I'll be happy to, to share with you some ideas about what we're doing. But the idea is more to talk to you about uh, what I do uh, as a part of the uh, uh, board mem as a part of the board of the Mobile Marketing Association. And as Anlor was saying, uh, the Mobile Marketing Association is very involved in uh, uh, developing best practices, developing understanding, developing uh, ideas about how to be more successful on mobile. And uh, uh, that's basically what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to talk about very different things. You've seen that in the, uh, in the agenda today. We're going to talk about uh, objectives. We're going to talk about briefs. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, of course, budgets. We're going to talk about how to structure uh, you way to mobile, and we're going to talk also about some technologies. Uh, so we're going to try to cover a lot of things. Uh, of course, you know, I, I appreciate that not all of you are exactly on the same page, so we'll try to accommodate as much as possible. But the good thing is uh, most of you are up for uh, your first application, and hopefully what I'm going to share with you is going to be very interesting and, and insightful. And Last but not least, before we start, I think the idea is uh, uh, to give you a little bit of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, again, the privilege of some others before you who have tried mobile apps before. And uh, as you probably have guessed, you're not the first ones to think about a mobile app. And, uh, you know, as I said, right, uh, you know, there are some, uh, uh, you know, some, uh, some ugly truths about mobile apps. And we're going to try to cover, again, uh, what some of the pitfalls you might want to avoid, or some of the best practices you want to you want to embrace. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started. First, let me kind of set the stage, you know, for what we're talking about when we're talking about mobile apps. Uh, you probably have figured out by now uh, that there are today a fairly limited number of platforms that are really uh, 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 that are really important on mobile. You know, we uh, we have completely. Uh, uh, past the, the time where BlackBerry and, and some others were, were factors on the market. Effectively, if you want to be kind of full scope, there are three players. If you, know, be, if you want to be narrow scope, there are two players on the market. And namely, we're talking about Apple, Google, and somewhat Microsoft. Uh, and if you're looking at uh, the European or the French market, Microsoft is slightly more of a factor. If you're looking at the global market, as you could see here, uh, Microsoft is, is a smaller player. So again, if you're talking about developing a mobile app, you're really talking about developing an iOS, an Android, and possibly a, a Windows uh, uh, mobile application. The other thing that, uh, that you have to, uh, of course, understand is when you're talking about developing mobile app, you're talking about developing uh, an app with a specific language, right? And we're going to talk about that again. But uh, you're talking about different languages on these different platforms, which makes uh, the thing not so easy. You're talking also about uh, very different form factors, because uh, we're talking about uh, mobile phones, we're talking about tablets, potentially all the way up to PCs, and all the way down to wearables like this. So you know, we're talking about a lot of different form factors. And to make things worse, uh, you know, there are specific things that make uh, um, uh, the development of mobile apps uh, very cumbersome, especially the submission process, because, uh, again, if you haven't realized by now, you don't have a full control of, uh, over what's happening with your mobile app. You have to submit it to get it approved, to get it uh, deployed. Uh, so that's a fairly cumbersome process, again, if you compare it to a, a simple website. 
So, you know, that's kind of the, the, the stage. And last but not least, you know, there are some fees associated with it. I'm, I won't go into details with that. Now, you know, for those of you who have tried to develop a mobile app before, uh, your idea or your initial idea may still be, for those of you who haven't tried, is, well, I have the best idea in the world. Of course, you're here. You know, you have a, 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 a specific plan with a great idea. You're going to change the world. Of course, I'm going to develop a mobile app. That's a straight line you know, into, uh, into developing something. Well, some of the ugly truth is, you know, what's happening at the bottom here is the reality is translating your idea in something is a very cumbersome process, right? And uh, it's definitely not as straightforward as it may seem initially. And there are some reasons to that, right? And some of the reasons for that is an app is more than just a few lines of code. Right, uh, you probably again have uh, realized that before, but an app is definitely uh, behaving in terms of again the process, the development, the maintenance we're going to talk about. So it's, it's more than just uh, you know uh, spitting out a few lines of code and putting something on the market. Other thing uh, as well is an app is different and more than a website, and in many ways, right? We've talked about uh, uh, basically the fact that you're going to deploy an app on you know, hundreds, thousands, hopefully millions of, uh, of mobile devices. And, uh, and of course, you know, that's very, very different because you don't have the control over the code as you may have for, uh, for a website. And if you think about it, really, an app is both a boon, right? Because you have opportunities with an app that you probably don't have with a website, uh, but it's also a curse. And, uh, and the way I would phrase it best, I think, is I think most people, you know, most people are startups, but believe it or not, most people as large enterprise as well don't realize that when they decide to develop a mobile app, in fact, they're changing, you know, their, their job, right? And they're changing their purpose. They're moving from a situation where they used to do a lot of websites and they're basically, you know, a website is definitely a kind of a window uh, on, a, on a catalog, a product catalog, a service or whatever, when you're moving to a mobile app, effectively you become a software house and you become a service provider, right? And you're going to have the liability of this code sitting on, again, millions of devices, hopefully, if you're successful. So you're really changing paradigm. And the reason why I'm putting this emphasis right now, again, is, again, you know, most of the people don't really realize how different it is to have just a simple website on the market and to have a mobile app, where, again, you have you know, some opportunities, but also some liabilities that go with it. And let's talk uh, briefly about that, right? Let's talk about some of the unique benefits and also some of the unique constraints that are attached to a uh, mobile app. First, on the benefits. Well, you know, there are very interesting things about mobile apps, right? You can definitely design a beautiful mobile app with absolutely gorgeous UX, uh, superb design, you have access to uh, devices capabilities, right, uh, that you uh, couldn't even dream of if you develop a simple website. You have the ability to provide an offline access to your user, which is, again, very unique to, uh, to mobile app. You can do uh, things like push notification, which is very, very interesting, uh, because that's one of the uh, unique ways you have to reach out to customers and make them very reactive, much more than you could do with uh, email or, or any other type of uh, communication. You have also the ability to have this uh, real estate on the, on the device, right? A few uh, uh, millimeters square or a few, uh, uh, a few, uh, a few imprints on your, uh, on your device where it's easy to get basically reused from your customers. And you have also the ability to have App Store visibility, which is in some ways a, a way for you to be, uh, to be discovered. At the same time, you know, there are some constraints and again, uh, you don't want to uh, to ignore these because they are very they are very significant. There is development cost associated with mobile apps. I've talked briefly before about the different platforms, the different device form factors. Of course, that induces a cost compared to uh, what you would do with a simple mobile uh, website. Uh, believe it or not, if you have an app, well, users need to download the app, right? So if they need to download the app, that's an additional effort that users need to do, and you need to accompany them, you need to encourage them, to urge them to download your app. You have something which is quite interesting, which is, you know, mobile is definitely this kind of instant, real-time device, 
But there is nothing less agile than a mobile app, right? Uh, you know, this mobile app, you know, has uh, its uh, code sitting on your device. And again, as I said, you don't have direct access to this code. So it's not as agile as a, as a mobile website. Uh, the maintenance costs are not to be ignored. And we'll come back to that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, there are some ratings and, uh, and some ways to be discovered on the, on, the, on, the, on the stores. But there are also some reviews and ratings, which might hurt you if you're not very careful. And uh, we'll talk about that as well. Uh, there are some issues about app discoveries. And app discovery is a very interesting thing, right? Because uh, uh, when you're on the web, you're talking basically about uh, you know, search engine optimization, search engine marketing. Uh, that's a very different game on, uh, on app stores where there are you know, today millions of apps. And trying to get uh, visibility on the stores is not an easy thing. So you have to take that uh, into consideration as well. And App instrumentation is also something that is very interesting. We'll come back to that as well. But uh, uh, the, the app can very easily be a black box for you, uh, which means that uh, you have very little visibility about what's happening in the app or what are users doing with your app unless you have the appropriate uh, instrumentation, SDKs most of the time, so kind of bits of codes running in the app telling you, you know, what's happening in the app. Again, it's a very different process to, uh, to what you have with uh, websites. And last but not least, to kind of talk about these uh, uh, constraints, uh, I want to share with you a little bit about uh, what are some of the reasons why your app might be rejected, right? And uh, again, if you're thinking about a mobile website, well, that's easy, right? You develop your website, even if it's not that good, you know, it uh, sits out there and you have time to, uh, to improve it. On, on mobile app, on the mobile app world, uh, your app is uh, validated. That's especially true with, uh, with Apple. And your app might be rejected, uh, which again is a, is a very, uh, is a very uh, concerning uh, thought uh, if, you're, uh, if you're trying to be uh, on market as soon as possible. And these reasons why you might be rejected uh, they're not from me, right? They're directly from Apple, so you can check that uh, on their website. Uh, so I put, well, it's not there, but it's in the final version of my slides. There is the reference uh, on, uh, on the site uh, where uh, it sits. And, um, and one thing you will, you will notice on this, uh, on this slide is uh, uh, the, a lot of the information for why people are rejecting, well, for why Apple is rejecting, is rejecting application is mostly coming from information that, uh, that you provide about the app. So if you add up the, uh, the blue, it's not very clear here, but the, 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 the blue uh, um, items that are uh, listed on the left of the screen, uh, you end up with about 20% of the reasons for rejection uh, coming from not having the right, uh, 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 the right documentation, the right information, the right data about the app. Uh, which again is nothing has nothing to do with what the app is about or whatever. It's uh, again about uh, about data that has not been correctly provided vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, of course, uh, uh, Apple rules. So I'll I'll give you that for further reading when you have time. You can you can look at that in details. The the first thing probably when you develop a mobile app that you have really to think about. Uh, is uh, of course you have an idea about a mobile app. You know that's your whole, you know, startup idea in some ways. Uh, but one of the things you probably need to realize uh, very early on is what is the business purpose of your app? Because unless you're in the uh, uh, you're in the uh, um, uh, in the uh, not-for-profit uh, organizations or uh, whatever, uh, your app has a role to play in business, right? And to me, there are only three main categories that where it makes sense. Either your app is here to develop uh, a business revenue stream for you, or it saves money somewhere, right? Or it builds customer relationships uh, and builds customer loyalty ultimately. If if there are not, if your app is not doing one of these things, then there is something fishy, if you ask me, right? Uh, because uh, uh, you probably don't have, have not figured out your business model yet. And if you have not, then it's probably something you need to, uh, to take care of very, very soon. But anyway, to, to come back to that, uh, the interesting thing is with mobile apps, you can do a lot of things like that, right? You can definitely streamline, you know, streamline processes, you can optimize costs, you can build customer loyalty, and you can more and more make revenue on mobile. 
And that's where I want to spend a little bit more time because there are many ways in reality where you can use your app uh, to develop business. One of the initial ways that uh, people thought about uh, uh, building revenue with mobile apps is selling an app on the store, right? You know, that's one of the things you probably have seen, all of you. Well, let me break the news for you, unless you haven't realized yet. Uh, but, you know, charging for an app for a download, that's basically a dead model, right? So don't even try to do that uh, unless you have uh, a specific game in mind or things like that. But uh, otherwise, you're not going to be very, very successful in charging people to download your app. The model where even most of the game guys have gone to is uh, in-app purchase. So you download the app for free, you try it for some time, and then you have uh, purchases within the app that allow you to monetize your app. Uh, there are other things you know, that, uh, that you can do to monetize app. Advertising, which used to be very, uh, you know, again, limited, cumbersome on mobile, is getting there. So it's one way where you can, of course, monetize your app. Uh, I'm saying it's getting there because it's probably not as, uh, as uh, developed and as uh, fruitful as you might think it would be, but it's getting there. If you do it, my, my advice would be do it right, which is do it in a native way. So don't try to use banners or, uh, you know, kind of the old, uh, you know, uh, old world of, uh, of the web. You know, try to do uh, native advertising, try to do a really uh, clever advertising in your app rather than, uh, you know, splash screens and banners and all of these uh, uh, old style of advertising. Uh, if you turn now to more kind of uh, selling with mobile, M-commerce is definitely a good trend. And if you look at uh, some of the major players out there, uh, whether it, so if you take examples in France, uh, you know, guys like Showroom Privé, like, uh, like Cdiscount, like uh, others. If you look uh, internationally, people like Amazon and others, a lot of their business is actually moving to mobile, right? Uh, it's, and it's uh, between 50% uh, plus on mobile, usually 30 to 40% on mobile apps, and uh, even for the, the best of them, it's, uh, it's actually even higher. So M-commerce is not something that is uh, kind of uh, on the fringe or starting to be there. It's, it's really becoming a reality and a big reality for a lot of players. And there are two other things that are developing as well, which are very interesting. One is mobile to store, so kind of driving people into the store with a mobile app. And that's basically what uh, every retailer in France and abroad are, uh, are dreaming about. And the other one, which is mobile in-store. So basically, what are you doing with your mobile when you're in the store? And these things are probably, again, a little bit more uh, uh, kind of a developing area. But uh, they're definitely in the, uh, in the move of, uh, of being mainstream in the coming years. Uh, now, if you look at uh, building your app, right? So the first thing you need to do is to kind of have a checklist and probably have an answer to all of the points you have right there. And again, you know, if, in, in case you're wondering, you, know, you have access to the slide. I think uh, Anlor uh, kind of posted them on, on the meetup, if I'm correct, right? So no worries. Uh, you don't need to you know, capture each and every screen. Uh, you'll have access to that, and you have access to that if you look uh, if you look up on the internet right now. But anyway, building your app, you know, there are a few things you need to think about, right? One is uh, is uh, to think about your strengths and weaknesses. So if you're kind of on a blank page, you know, you probably don't have much. But if you, if it's not your first app, for instance, or if you already have a website, if you have some uh, uh, some assets, you know, it's worth looking at them and see how you can leverage them. The second is you need to look at market and competitors, right? And, uh, and on that, let, 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 me pause that uh, let me pause on that for a second, if you mind, right? Uh, competitors, so how many of you have competitors? I'd be, wow, I'm surprised some of you think you don't have any competitors. But anyway, uh, so you know your competitors, right? Right? So can anyone here give me a, who are their competitors? What? Okay, that's Rabbit. Who are your competitors? Give it to me. Blackboard. Blackboard. Any others? No. Sh shout it out. No. Well, let me let me tell you. I I know at least three or four competitors, right? That all of you have, and you probably don't think about, right? You want me to name them? 
Number one, Facebook. Number two, Uber. Number three, Airbnb. And I, I couldn't you know, take the list for a longer time. The reason for why they are your competitors, they might not be on your market, right? Uh, they might not even be close to, uh, to what you do. It's not even because a lot of the time that people spend on mobile are with these apps. The reason for them being your competitors is your app, your app or your app coming up is going to be judged vis-a-vis -vis these applications, right? Because all of us, you know, use these apps, right? <laughs> so the thing to realize is, of course, you know your competitors, right? Um, you know, the Blackboard, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the TaskRabbits and so on. But think about your competitors in a slightly different ways, right? And, and we'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes. But when people are looking at your app, whether you like it or not, whether we like it or not, whether even users like it or not, they're going to look and compare it to the apps they use the best, right, or the most. And, and these are the Facebooks, the Uber, the Airbnb, and whatever apps they're using on a daily basis or on a, on a weekly basis. So think about that. Um, other thing that is very interesting is customers and customer behaviors, right? And the way you need to understand customers is very, very important because that's how you're going to uh, define how you app is behaving and how your app is uh, answering customer needs. Needs and pain points are, of course, something that you need to look at. Uh, set very specific, you know, clear KPIs and objectives is also very important because you want to be able to uh, assess whether you're moving in the right direction with your app or not. You're going to have to, uh, to look at your app and define its features and its positioning and look at your app as a product, right? Uh, remember, now you're a, you're a software house, you're developing software, so, uh, so you need to look at your app as a product and position it vis-a-vis uh, -vis other, other app in the, in the store. Uh, of course, you need to identify uh, budgets, resources, and so on, and uh, we're going to come back to that as well, so I won't dive more. Um, in the end, you know, your process is going to follow these different phases, right? Uh, so the thing you don't want to do is what we said in the beginning is I have an idea, I ask someone to code directly, uh, you know, some of the things I want to, uh, to have in my app, you know, that's a good recipe for failure. What you want is uh, you want to structure your process and the first thing is do this analysis and planning and you can use the checklist we've gone through before to really do a very in-depth analysis of your market and what you want to do with, uh, with your app. The second one is spend a good amount of time, and we're going to dive into details there, about your user experience, UX, stands for user experience, your UI, so user interface, and all the conception and design of your mobile app. So that's the first thing you want to do, even before starting to code any line in your app. Of course, then there is uh, you know, some development involved, otherwise that would be weird. And at the end, you need also to ensure that you have some appropriate amount of resources and time uh, allocated to testing. And testing is a very important thing that you need to think about and you need uh, to, be, uh, to be mindful about. And last but not least, there is a maintenance and this whole thing is actually a cycle, right? So it kind of uh, moves in cycle. The reason why is because, uh, and that's one of the curse of a mobile app, is once you put the, your finger into the mobile app world, uh, either you exit because you failed, and if you haven't failed, then you keep on iterating on your mobile app, right? So it's going to be a never-ending process where you're going to keep, you know, generating new features and new versions of your app ever and ever again. So let's talk a little bit about uh, UX and UI. And, uh, and first, let me tell you why it is important that you, uh, you spend some time on that. The reason, and I'll admit, right, 70% is not a scientific calculation. So I put it there. You can, you know, uh, blame me for being kind of uh, either arrogant of uh, making a too big of a number or uh, uh, being uh, not, very, uh, not very specific. Okay, it might be 60, it might be 80, it might be 50, never mind, right? The point is your user experience and your UI is going to drive a tremendous amount of your end result in terms of ROI of your app. And the reason why is because this is the piece that really drives two major things in your app, which is retention, because the worst thing you want to do is produce an app, have people using once and not returning again. You know, that's the worst thing that can happen to you. 
And the second thing is engagement, so that what you want to do is take users, make them come back, and make them use your app, not just kind of browse and, uh, and look at uh, one or two pages and leave. What you want is people diving in your app and really using the core features of your app. And for you to realize uh, or to achieve this, uh, you're going to have to spend a very significant amount of time thinking about your user interface and your overall user experience. What it's going to deliver is it's going to deliver an app which is uh, which is usable. That's the first thing, of course. It's going to deliver an app which makes things done very easily and very quickly, very efficiently for your user. Uh, it's going to make also sure that your app is again very competitive and and kind of uh, delivers value for your brand and is competitive against the Facebooks and the Ubers and others that we talked about. Uh, it's going to build an engagement and trust, and believe me, it's very important, especially if your app is trying to uh, uh, to generate revenue, so make users convert, you know, uh, purchasing something, doing in-app purchase, uh, whatever it is. Building engagement and trust is very, very critical, and believe me, small things can make a huge difference. Small things can make a huge difference. So you need to be very careful about that and make sure that your app is, uh, is uh, really you know, again, delivering this kind of uh, confidence message when you look at your uh, user interface. And user satisfaction is very critical as well because on mobile apps, again, you have this uh, very weird process of user rating your, uh, your mobile app. And uh, if you develop a mobile website or a, a website, you don't give a shit about uh, you know how uh, people think about your your website, right? Worst case, you know, one guy is pissed off. Pff, you know, nobody's going to find out anyway, right? Uh, if you have one guy who is really pissed off with your mobile app, you can be sure he's going to be he's going to be talking about everyone and uh, about it with everyone. And and so that's one thing that's going to hurt not only, of course, your existing community, but more importantly, the new users who are going to come to your app and try to see if it's an app worth downloading or not. And so that's a piece you really don't want to don't want to evacuate as a, as a minor point. Uh, the piece which is also very very interesting there is that uh, you can think about best practices of how to manage uh, customer feedbacks. So for instance, instead of uh, saying, "Hey, do you want to rate my app and send people to uh, to the App Store?" you want to say, "Hey, are you happy or unhappy about uh, about the app?" If you're happy, then you can send them to the store to rate the app. If they're unhappy, you can say, hey, give me a feedback. You know, I want to improve, you know, give me a feedback. So send me an email, you know, do whatever I want. So that way, it's a very simple way, for instance, of making sure that mostly happy users are going to the app store to rate your app. And most of the unhappy customers are providing you the feedback to improve and not necessarily complaining directly on the app store. So kind of a tip to, uh, to ensure that you, you improve a little bit your, your ratings out there. Uh, let me talk about you know one of the apps we talked about, right? So Airbnb. Let me ask you this question: What what makes Airbnb great? G give me some answers. You know, is it you know is it the features? Is it uh, is it the UI? Is it visual? visual? Yeah. Any any other idea? Usability is of use. What? Simplicity, exactly. You, know, you want, uh, I don't know, you want a coffee at the bar? <laughs> uh, the uh, simplicity is actually the, the, so it's one of the answers. And, uh, and uh, again, it's not me, it's you know, somebody at Airbnb saying that, right? Uh, simplicity, and, and that's so interesting, right? When you think about you know, mobile apps, initially you're going to say, oh, I want to cram a lot of features, I want to do plenty of things, I want to be a kind of all things to all people, and so on. But when we look at what Airbnb is saying, as their, one of their uh, criteria for success, they say it's simplicity, right? It's making sure that uh, the user is doing something very quickly and efficiently with their app, okay? Something to remember. Let's talk about development. I, I don't want to bore you with uh, development details, so we're gonna not going to dive into too much detail. I just want to talk briefly about one concept, which you're probably going to hear if you haven't heard before, which is agility. And uh, agility versus uh, the V models, you know, it's a kind of a buzzword anyway. 
the only reason why I want to bring that up is uh, agility is uh, is uh, is something that you're probably going to be confronted with, because in reality, on mobile and on mobile app, there are very little other options than doing what they call agile development, right? And uh, what agile development means is no, your app is not going to be agile. You know, so it's you have to be careful about what it means. Really, what it really means is that instead of diving into a long process we're gonna, where it's going to take months before you have the end result, most probably the way you're going to do it or you're going to have it done is uh, uh, small iterations of developments. So instead of again, you know, several months of development in a in a big tunnel, you're going to have small iterations where you're going to have bits and pieces of your app being built over time. And you're going to see your app kind of uh, uh, evolving over time and being the, uh, the final result. So there are a few interesting points about that. The fact is uh, it allows you to be a little bit more closer to your uh, customer needs because if you know your customer needs, you can check that your app is actually in line with uh, responding to these customer needs instead of, again, discovering it uh, six months afterwards. Uh, and the other thing which is really interesting as well is that's going to allow you to uh, control a little bit more of the delays. I won't go again into the details. You know, some people will will tell you about uh, more details if you want. We can discuss about it later. But just for your information, uh, let's talk about another one of these apps, which I think is a very interesting one, which is Uber. Why do you think? What What do you think makes Uber a great app? Effective. Effective? Simplicity, yeah. Well, it's not always simplicity the right answer, but <laughs> any any other ideas? Reactivity and context, yeah. Real time, good point, yeah. Geolocation, yeah. Better monitoring and trust building. You're right, yeah. It's a good point. So let me give you not necessarily the answer, but. You know, one of the best answers they can they can give, and they're not very talkative about it. But uh, there is a, a great article you, I, I would suggest you read, uh, just you know, for information and and also for understanding what makes a great app, right? Because there as well, what I want to maybe dismiss is a kind of a myth, right? When we're talking about developing a mobile app, again, we're talking a lot or often about cramming features into the code of a mobile app, right? But in reality, and more and more, a mobile app is not code that only runs on the mobile, right? It's really code that is running on servers that serves actually some pretty you know, strong features or strong services to the user on the mobile app. And when you look at uh, Uber, Uber, they have a concept which, again, I, I encourage you to, to look at, which is called the perfect ride. Have you, have you ever heard of that, the perfect ride? No? Again, have a look at it. You know, it's, you know, granted, it's, it's kind of specific to, uh, to Uber. What I think is really interesting is the way they approach it, right? And the way they approach it is basically they're thinking about all of the elements of what makes a perfect ride for the uh, traveler and for the driver. And they look at basically how they can optimize, uh, you know, the driver picking up the, uh, the traveler, the traveler hopping into the taxi, the taxi traveling, the taxi preparing for its next, uh, uh, for its next uh, passenger, uh, the, tr the driver going back to, uh, to home at the end of the day. So basically they look at uh, optimizing each and every bit of the process. And of course, all of that is happening on the server, not on the mobile app itself, right? The, the app itself is serving a few, ser a few screens and a few things like that. But a lot of the uh, intelligence is effectively on the server. And that's one of the things I would, of course, encourage you to do is you know, when you think about developing your mobile app, think really about what's going to happen on your mobile app and what kind of intelligence are you going to onboard on your app, but also and mostly what kind of intelligence you're going to onboard on your servers because that's really most of the time where the value of your app is going to reside. So more on the servers and possibly less on the device. Make sense? Uh, let's talk about testing a little bit. Testing is also, as I said, a very important piece. Why? Because you know your app needs to be, of course, a very solid piece of software at the end, right? And what, it, what I mean by that, it needs to be usable, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be high-performing, 
you know, you know, you're talking about uh, you know software design, and uh, in this case, what you're talking about is making sure uh, that your app is going to be uh, is going to be effectively something that you really can test things on, you can learn, and you can improve over time. And so that's where testing is very is very uh, interesting, and you can do user testing, so you know, trying your your app in front of testers. Uh, you can do uh, uh, virtual machine testing to optimize performance. You can test crashes. You can do A/B testing if you want. You know, we can talk about that together. You know, I mean, you can do plenty of things, right? But above and all, my my point there is to say, what you're gonna have to do is realize that your app is ne a never-ending process. We talk about that, and it's a kind of a hit and run type of uh, type of. Uh, uh, voyage, right? So you're gonna try a few things. It's gonna work. It's gonna not gonna work. So you're gonna move on. And the idea is, how can you learn over time? And learning is probably the process you're gonna you're gonna be the most uh, uh, the most interested about when you're doing this uh, this kind of testing. Talking about maintenance, you know, we talk about maintenance as well. There as well, it's very important because uh, you're gonna have to uh, to iterate a lot about. Uh, uh, you know what uh, what your app is doing and uh, move your app forward and believe it or not you know your app uh, is going to be obsolete within three months you know either because of you because of your competitors or because of the operating system so you're going to have to do something with your app and I would I don't want to discourage you right but I would I would tend to say that it's very very unlikely that your ROI on your app is going to materialize in less than a year so you have this gap where you know you're going to have to be there in the long haul, and at the same time your app uh, is going to need to be serviced and is going to be to be improved. And there are some minor changes you need to improve on and uh, fix bugs, fix bugs with your platform, fix bugs with new versions of OSs, uh, and so on and so forth. UI, and you need to also plan for major release, which kind of is above and beyond and is going to help you. Uh, again, take these uh, learnings that you take from testing, from user feedbacks, and so on, to improve your app and make sure that your app is delivering on its promise. Talking about the budget, if you want, but again, you know these these numbers and these uh, and these uh, dates and and so on are only indicative, right? So it's not the hard call, the truth for everyone everywhere, uh, but you know it's a stake in the ground to give you an approximation of how long it's going to take and uh, how much it may cost, right? Uh, so if you look at uh, the first phase we talked about, which is UX, UI, and so on, it's going to take several weeks. Uh, your development, it's going to take several months. Testing, it's going to take several weeks again. And of course, it's going to vary de depending on how complex your app is, right? If your app is not so complex, it's probably a two or three month process. If your app is very complex, it might take six months or more to uh, to develop, and it's going to cost anywhere between you know 10k, you know 50k, 100k. Again, you know you'll you'll have you'll have this table if you want to play with it. Um, the the bottom line, what I'm saying, what I'm getting at here, is developing a mobile app is not cheap. You might find ways to cut uh, corners. Uh, you can outsource. You can uh, offshore. You can do plenty of things. In the end, it's still going to cost a chunk of money, right? And uh, uh, you're going to outsource. It's less expensive, but it's going to take more time. So in the end, it's going to be a, a significant amount of money. If you insource or if you do uh, things in-house, well, it's going to take a learning curve. It's going to take... So, you know, however you look at it, it's going to cost some money. That's part of my point, right? Again, we can take questions on that uh, at the end if you want. Uh, anybody is uh, is uh, also uh, a geek here, so wants to dive into the uh, hybrid versus uh, native uh, ethanol debate. Uh, again, I, I I juggle down on this table kind of all the reasons for choosing whatever option, and uh, the way I chose to represent it, it's kind of uh, on an axis where you know the the high the the high line is uh, is native, and so the higher you get, it, the more native you are the lower you get, the more hybrid or HTML-like you are. Basically, there I've listed, uh, you know, kind of four lines, you know, uh, uh, Apache, Cordova, or or, uh, or PhoneGap, uh, Titanium, uh, Accelerator, if you guys have heard about this, uh, Xamarin, and, uh, you know, Full Native. So we can dive into that. 
if you if you don't want to dive into that, I have the 60 second answer for what is the right choice for your project. So we can we can do that directly if you want, right? Again, you know, for those of you who are uh, who are excited about it, uh, we can dive into the discussion. But the real answer to this question is what is written here, right? So my recommendation, you can take it or leave it, right? But my recommendation is no, don't make it a philosophical discussion, don't make it a technological discussion, don't even make it a budget discussion, right? But make it a resource issue, my take again, right? Because in reality, you know, there is no clear winner, right? So it's every choice is gonna cost you a shitload of money, right? Even the simplest things. Uh, you're gonna have trade-offs all over the place. You're gonna sacrifice performance, sacrifice, uh, uh, you know, UX, sacrifice uh, time, sacrifice budget, whatever it is, right? In the end, you know, you don't have a clear winner, so, you, you know, you're not good anywhere, right? My take is for you, for you, each of you, right, to get, uh, to get the best result, what you need to arbitrate on is resource. You know, find the resource either internally, if you have it, or externally, find the best resource you can get, check out what their competencies are and go with whatever competencies they are the most comfortable with. Because that's the best chance of success you may have, right? Uh, of course, you know, if we can afford it and if you have the right resources, go native, right? Otherwise, you know, go with whatever resources you have because that's the best chance of success you have, frankly, you know, my experience. You, again, take it or leave it. Uh, some additional element to, to consider, and we're, we're going to close this right after because we need to spend some time with questions as well. Uh, take a user-centric approach. Pff, you know, that's of course, you know, a kind of uh, an obvious comment. But uh, what I'm saying by that, and uh, one quote I have, I have not here, but uh, which I'll give it to you anyway, is uh, uh, one of my favorite quotes is, is a guy from King. You know, the guy is at King, right? You know, they develop, uh, you know, all these fancy games that you have, the Candy Crush and so on. Uh, you know, one of the guy is, uh, is uh, his name is Ar uh, Arald Frost, if I remember uh, correctly his name. Uh, and uh, what he says is uh, uh, at least 50% of your assumptions are going to be proved wrong about your app, right? So what it means by that is, uh, uh, is effectively how you're going to design your app in the first place, even if you... Uh, look at user groups and user panels and experts and so on, 50% of your, what you're going to design is going to be wrong. And that's what they experienced, right? You know, they figured out that everything they tested, you know, even, even their guts, even if their whatever advice they were getting was uh, in this direction, you know, users were going that direction or preferred that direction. So, again, don't trust anybody but your user is the first point. Uh, we talked a little bit about this kind of server and, and app thing, right? Uh, there is a high chance that your app is gonna is gonna be a very a very big project with server side elements with client side elements, and there is a high chance that over time your app or your service will need to interact with other tools, whether it's be uh, messaging apps, whether it could be third party apps, whether it could be uh, third party services. Uh, so think about your app also as a modular. Uh, platform that can interact with other things, not only yourself, but can plug into other ser other services. Opt-in and privacy, my take as well. Uh, you might have different ideas about that, but uh, my take is bet on transparencies. You know, make sure that your users have control or have visibility about uh, what you're doing with their data. Uh, because again, on this one, my take is we have actually a crisis brewing Right, because if people think that with uh, with cookies, you know, uh, uh, the the websites have a lot of information and control about uh, about uh, about what they're doing, wait until they figure out what we know about them with mobile apps. Right. So my take is, if you don't want to be burned, like many of people will be, I think in the in the short to mid term future, bet on transparency and bet on opt-in. Uh, other thing we didn't talk a little bit about, but uh, is worth considering, is deep linking and uh, app store optimization. You know that's a very thing, a very key thing if you want to dive a little bit further into, uh, you know, how to have your app discovered. Um, SDKs as well. You know we talked a little bit about instrumentation, but your app is very quickly going to be uh, uh, 
a receptacle for tons of SDKs, whether it's analytics, UX analytics, heat maps, uh, uh, push notification, uh, trackers, uh, advertising, you know, and so on. So, uh, you know, you have to, to be mindful about that because that's a lot of third party uh, 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 code that is going to run in your app. And of course, you have to pick them and choose them wisely. And, uh, and uh, one more thing, if you, uh, if you don't mind, there is a good news about it, which is we're actually going into an app world. And, uh, and the good news about it is that actually uh, by you choosing to develop an app, well, the world is probably yours. Thank you. And so I probably ran a little bit over, but uh, I think we still have time for Q&A, right? We do. So uh, fire at will. <laughs> and uh, Anne Lore, by the way, uh, by the way, as the uh, as the mic, so she is gonna uh, go around and, and pass the mic to everyone who has a question. Go ahead. Hi. So you say we're in competition with Facebook and Airbnb and the likes. Yeah. Because um, everybody likes their beautiful apps and they expect that from an app. Um, so my question is in two parts. First sure. one, obviously we don't have the same budget, so how do we manage that? And the second one is our developers, they keep um, busting our balls for us to get our app out. They tell us we're too perfectionist, we just need to get it out there, not spend time and money on getting everything perfect first time. So what is your take on that? So, so the question being, uh, I don't know if everybody heard the other question. So the question was, uh, you know, how do you match uh, the Facebooks and the Airbnb knowing they have uh, uh, more developers and resources than you have, right? Which is a fair point. And, uh, and uh, the, the second question was, uh, or the second part of the question was, uh, you know, their, their developers is, uh, are busting their, uh, their way out of, uh, uh, to, to, to put the, the, the app out there. And, uh, you know, how do you, uh, how do you make sure that uh, you combine, you know, both this uh, notion of uh, getting out there and also being mindful? So you're right; it's a, it's a balance to strike. Uh, so don't misread what I said, right? So I'm not suggesting you're going to try to meet or to match, you know, what uh, the Facebook and the Airbnb and the Ubers are doing, uh, because you're never going to be able to match that in a long time. You know, they're iterating. At any point in time, you know, just to give you an idea, but uh, you know they're iterating app every one, two, three weeks, right? So they have uh, releases every one, two, or three weeks. Uh, at any point in time, guys like Twitter, Amazon, Facebook, they have approximately 100 to 400 variations of their app out there in testing, in A/B testing, right? So you're not going to match them, right? Uh, not shortly. I I wish you are, but uh, not shortly. My point is more to say. When you look at uh, at you know these uh, these user experiences you know that they provide, don't discard them by saying, "Well, I'm not in the same in the same business as Facebook. I'm not in the same business as Airbnb," and and you can you know take a page from what they've done, right? So you can leverage what they've done. You can look at their interface. You can look at the good ideas they have, right? To to simplify things. You can look at. Uh, you know, some of the things they are introducing as uh, new ways of presenting data at uh, simplifying the steps in uh, the process. And uh, so I'm not saying, you know, just mimic them or just uh, copy them, whatever. I'm just saying a lot of the times, one, they're going to have good ideas. So why don't you look at them and, you know, uh, uh, get inspired? Uh, the second thing is uh, they're going to, they're gonna, uh, again, test a lot of things and, gonna, and they're going to find actually new ways uh, which are both new standards, and sometimes you probably want to uh, to leverage those. And again, new ideas you might not have uh, on your side, which are good things that you can inherit. So again, what I'm saying is don't try to match them in terms of resources. Just you know, get inspired by what they do and, and try to, uh, to, to snuggle a few good ideas into your app. And as you said, I think one of the things you want to do uh, first and foremost is making sure your app is out there as first as possible because one of the things I also said is the best way you want to improve your app is also getting feedback about your app and understanding what people think about your app, which is you know the best idea you can do to uh, to to improve your app in the best way. Can you give examples of uh, platforms to do some uh, prototyping of apps before uh, submitting into the app store so either a platform where you can you know, prototype uh, an app, and another one 
where you could share an app with users, with testers, without having an official app on the App Store or Android, whatever. Yeah, uh, I, I must admit, I you know there are a few uh, on the on the on the wire framing and so on. There are a few tools, and the name escaped me right now, but uh, I'll. I'll I envision, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Envision you. and uh, Marvel for free. Right, good, good points. Thank you for helping me. <laughs> uh, and on the on the other point you were you were talking about, there are tools like uh, uh, Test Flight, for instance, which you can uh, which you can use. Uh, you know, in our case, we often use also Daewi, which is also a way to deploy. And you can use also sometimes uh, the 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 private uh, uh, functionality of uh, stores. So. Uh, uh, basically create a private uh, app store to deploy. Usually it's done for internal deployment within enterprise, which you can use to uh, to share also in a controlled way to uh, to users without having to post uh, the app on the store itself. Hello. Yeah. Um, what do you think about developing your application offshore like in India? As I briefly said, uh, you know, that's an option. You know, that's a good option to try and uh, minimize cost. The, the main issue that I see is uh, uh, it's often harder to get a good grasp about uh, you know, what people are doing. Are they really following your ideas? You might have languages issues. And uh, often you're going to have uh, much lower cost in terms of uh, uh, you know, cost per hour or cost per day or whatever. But often it's going to take a longer time, either because people are less uh, capable or less responsive or they just take more time to make more money. So. Bottom line, you know, in, in some cases, in some simple projects, it might make sense. But uh, again, I would be a little bit uh, careful about uh, what offshoring, what uh, outsourcing, what outsourcing you do, and uh, and not thinking you're gonna cut your budget by ten because that's not ever gonna be the case. Right. Uh, I'm just in a phase of honing my ideas, so kind of a broad question. Right. Um, you talked about the cookies and the safe bet on transparency and user control. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, in your opinion, how smart or not smart uh, it would be to rather um, to think of a curated option within the app, so you rely on asking the user about, uh, about one's tastes and expectations. Uh, you, you, you know, what, uh, I mean, I would like to offer like a curated selection of services right. based on the interests and the taste of the user. So I would need to ask the user uh, what his tastes are. So no, no, I, I, and, I, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, right? You, you should, if, you know, whatever you think is is uh, is a uh, an appropriate use of uh, uh, information for your service. You should ask uh, information. What I'm saying is. You should be transparent with what you do afterwards, after collecting this data, right? So are you going to sell it to someone else? Are you going to just store it for your own purposes? Uh, what kind of information might you, you know, do you, do you collect that you're not telling the user? Because, you, you know, effectively on a mobile app, you can know virtually everything, right? You can know, you know, where the guy is, you know, what he's doing, what kind of mobile he has, you know, uh, you could potentially know his contacts. I mean, you, you can potentially collect Tons and tons of data, right? And so what I'm just saying is be, again, my advice is be as transparent as possible with the users about what data you're collecting and what you're collecting for and what you're going to do it, what you're going to do with your data later on, right? There is, I don't know if you guys had a look at uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the announcement that was made by Orange last week, you know, uh, where they had this... Uh, uh, conference where they announced the new live box and so on. They announced a very interesting, uh, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, initiative, which is called uh, the Trust Badge, or Badge de Confiance en français. Uh, and the Trust Badge is, uh, is basically they developed that for their own apps, and they're putting the uh, this uh, this uh, functionality as an SDK on open source, so you can uh, you can look at it and uh, decide to integrate yourself in your apps. And basically, it's a it's a predefined SDK that allows the user to have control over what kind of data is collected by the app and whether he wants to opt in or opt out. And so it gives you basically all the functionality to collect the uh, data and let the user know about uh, what you're collecting and what you're doing with it. So it's a, I think it's a good initiative because it's a way of uh, simplifying the, 
development that otherwise all of you are going to do anyway if you decide to go in that direction. And you can pick and choose the bits that you're interested in, imp import it in your app, and uh, you don't have to develop it at all. It's already developed. You just have to skin it with your with your app interface, and that's all. So it's I thought it was a good in, a good initiative they were doing, and it's open source. So any yeah. Uh, you spoke about uh, the production process as uh, UX, then development, then uh, testing. After that, uh, maintenance. Uh, and in the opposite side, there, there is a, uh, the traditional way, uh, the ADI module analysis, development, uh, design, development, uh, implementation, then evaluation. Uh, is it uh, more efficient if we ignore uh, implementation and uh, go further in evaluation or, or testing before uh, put, it, put it as a real product, as a real uh, custom for, for someone, to, for users, to, t to try it, to test it, then give us uh, feedback, or uh, we have to make the whole process then return back by, uh, by feedback? Well, in the end, you, you, you just have to, to choose what is best for you, I think, right? Uh, what, what I was suggesting here is there are a few steps that you don't want to miss. You know, that was my main point, right? You, you don't want to miss, you know, spending a good amount of time in uh, uh, UX, UI, and design. Uh, you don't want to miss, you know, of course, the, the development phase and moving it correctly. You don't want to miss, you know, the testing phase. You know, if you want to add or if you want to change things around and so on, I'm not suggesting, you know, this is kind of the only thing you should do, and uh, this is the process you should not, uh, uh, you should not uh, move away from it or whatever. I think you know you need to uh, to adapt it to whatever makes sense best for you and for what your developers are most uh, used to. I'm just suggesting again, there are a few things you don't want to miss if you want to be successful. That's all. And I think the notion of iterating on a regular basis on uh, on the development of your app is definitely something that especially on mobile is very, very important, I think, because time, you know, we talked about that right before, but time is really everything, right? Uh, uh, time is against you all the time, if you so to speak, right? So uh, it's against you because you have competitors out there, it's against you because you need to make revenue or you need to make something out, you know, uh, uh, happen. Uh, you need to improve as fast as possible as soon as you get uh, feedback from users. Uh, so knowing that time is against you, the ability to iterate on a very, very uh, uh, regular basis or a very short basis is, I think, very, very critical. I have a very good one for many of us. Okay. Where to find good app developers? <laughs> <laughs> I think if anyone knew here, you know, we would be uh, we would be the best uh, the best people in the world in terms of uh, uh, wealth of uh, of uh, resources and and wealth um, uh, at all. But uh, uh, honestly, I think uh, the good thing is there are more and more developers coming from university now. You know, uh, I think that uh, developers have realized uh, that uh, that uh, you know there is definitely a need, a huge need on the market. Granted, you know there is a, there is a huge competition out there. Honestly, it's easier to find them uh, outside of Paris, right? Uh, unless you haven't noticed, right? <laughs> In Paris, there is a scarcity, so the prices are going up like this. Um, and it's you know believe me you know you know my my you know business is developing SDKs right so you know having having iOS or or Android developers is like difficult like this uh, you know having SDK developers is like over here so I, I'm keeping dearly my de my own developers for SDKs I can I can assure you but anyway no you you're right you know there is a, there is a lot of scarcity and that's one of the reasons also why when we talk briefly about uh, uh, you know, a different type of uh, hybrid or native development. What I was saying is where you're going to need to arbitrate is by resource availability and resource uh, capabilities because if if you have native guys, you know, native capable developers, well, you can go and build native, that's great, right? If you end up having only HTML, well, you may consider Cordova or PhoneGap. If you have, if you have uh, C Sharp developers, which is definitely easier, you can go Xamarin. So that's why I'm I'm... You know, again, maybe I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm having a different stance on this than other people. But 
again, I, I'm not saying, you know, don't give a shit. I'm, I'm just saying don't give a shit about budgets, don't give a shit about, uh, you know, uh, technology, don't give a shit about all of this. In reality, where you arbitrate is by resources, just because of what you said. I know. Uh, do you think it's a good idea to first develop uh, an app with an agency external and then to hire developers to continue the developing? Uh, because good. of the money, actually. <laughs> good question. Well, uh, good question. Uh, the the real question is a question of availability, of cost, of uh, of uh, of course fixed cost versus uh, variable cost. Uh, so, is it going to cost you more if you outsource development than in source? Most probably yes, because the the agencies have the same uh, constraint as uh, as we all have, which is you know finding developers and keeping them. So they need to pay them uh, a lot of uh, money and they need to uh, make a premium to. Uh, to make a living, so uh, it's going to cost a lot of money. So, is it uh, more flexible because you're not going to incur fixed cost, and because uh, it's possibly easier to find bandwidth? Yes. So, an agency is a good idea. Now, honestly, again, if you believe what I said, which is, you know, an app is your life and you know, if if your business is really relying on an app, your app is uh, your life and blood. And at some point in time, and sh sooner rather than later, you want to control your bread and butter, right? I mean, you want to, you know, have at least some level of control. And if you look at, you know, the large enterprise, okay, they have different means and different ways of doing things and so on. But the large enterprise initially, so two, three years ago, virtually every development was outsourced. And now they're moving in-house developers and they're doing two things. They're at the very least insourcing the project management and possibly just leaving the you know, coding resources out there. And if they can, they insource both the project management and the development resources. Yep. Yep. Uh, thanks for the amazing talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start with some uh, build on some of the answer, and sure. then I'm going to ask a question. Uh, about the resource scarcity, <laughs> never forget there is very good uh, university in Paris that are doing uh, IT. Just in front, uh, Jussieu, and uh, that has a dedicated uh, specialty in distributed system, yeah. where they learn to do mobile stuff. I agree. Also, don't forget that mobile app is very new, so you need to let time to your engineer to and your developer to spend time on MOOCs and else to form themselves. They know to do it, but you need to give them time. And uh, that's why uh, if you don't, it's normal that the resource is not going to grow. And now the, the question is ab about some app, because uh, there is competitor, but there is also allies like Facebook, Google, and else, and sometimes the application you need to build along with them. Mm -hmm. Do you have some advice on how to kind of try to build some partenariat when you, you see you're not in direct competition with Facebook, with uh, Google, whatever, but you build an app in their ecosystem. So mm -hmm. do you have some advice to how to kind of collaborate with them to kind of uh, have a win-win uh, cooperation? Uh, well, if, again, there, if I had the perfect answer, uh, uh, I would be rich probably as well. But uh, <laughs> uh, let, me, let, let me start by maybe saying, to well, first, thank you for reminding us that uh, there are great developers out there and great guys coming from development uh, uh, engineering schools, uh, because that's what I said, and I, I believe it as well. Uh, the, the the need for you to actually have partnership and to think broader than just your app and your app in isolation of the rest is, I think, a, a very good idea. I mean, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a must, but I think it's at least something that you need absolutely to consider, right? Because uh, it's hard to have a crystal ball about you know how apps are going to evolve over time. But as I said briefly in my talk as well, there is a very, very high chance that your app is going to be further and further integrated with other services. So talking about Facebook, for instance, you know, Facebook is starting to talk about this uh, uh, integration with Messenger. You know, we talked about Uber, right? Uber is going to start integrating their app with Messenger, Facebook Messenger. Facebook is starting to talk about bots. You know, I don't know if you heard about that, right? Uh, so they're going to have artificial intelligence capabilities that are going to be able to onboard in your app and uh, which is going to enable your app to, uh, to, to respond to certain things and so on and, and, and treat uh, data and, and customer input with a lot of intelligence. So 
I guess what I'm saying by that is saying that uh, don't look at Europe again in isolation anymore. Europe needs to be very connected with other partners. Uh, now, how to leverage the partners? Uh, it's a bit a harder uh, discussion. So, you know, in my case, for instance, you know, again, I don't develop apps, right? I develop uh, platforms, but uh, you know, we've done a lot of things to develop uh, partnerships with uh, a lot of the players out there uh, to integrate with push notification solutions, for instance, to integrate with analytics, to integrate with CRM systems. So, again, what I'm saying is uh, uh, one of the ways you have to uh, to uh, to do is to make sure that uh, if you build a partnership, you know, it helps you really differentiate from the competition. The real question you're going to have there, which is, again, the, the hard question to answer, is, of course, there is value for you. The real question is, what is the what is going to be the value for a Facebook or somebody else that you're going to bring on the table for them to listen to uh, to you a little bit more carefully than just any other developer? And that's, of course, the uh, the hardest answer, answer I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah? Yes, thanks for your presentation. I would like uh, to get your opinion on those uh, IT companies that are offering the development of an app uh, for a stake of the company. So IT for equity. If you ask me personally? Uh, person yeah, do you have any feedback <laughs> to share? I, I don't like it. No, I don't, but <laughs> what is your no, opinion? Because yeah, there are yeah, many, my... <laughs> more and more companies are offering such services. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's, it's the same, it, to me it's the same thing as, uh, you know, media companies offering you a stake of the, uh, or asking for a stake of the company for uh, advertising, uh, or uh, you know, other companies again for for this kind of exchange. Uh, I think it's uh, the reason I think it's a bad idea is because again, coming back to what I said, I think if you think your app is life and blood of your company, you know that's not something you wanna you wanna you wanna play with, right? Or you wanna exchange with. So I don't know if if you are absolutely desperate for. Uh, for money, if you're uh, if you have no other choice, if you're cornered, uh, you know, yeah, maybe maybe it's the right solution. But uh, to me, I think it would be it would be the last resort before before going there because uh, uh, again, you know, that's uh, a bit of a, a pact with the devil in some ways, right? So uh, and and again, you, what you really want to do and where you want to to project yourself is uh, again having control of your app. If you think again, your app is at the core of your project. Which I think is more and more the case, right? So, uh, and and by doing these kind of deals, you know, it's going to be a very hard way for you to uh, regain control. Or even if you regain control, you're going to still have guys, uh, you know, in your capital, kind of, uh, you know, playing whatever role to influence you and so on. <coughs> Bad idea. My take. <laughs> One last question, maybe. Some companies make. Uh mobile apps and website uh, which is uh, offering uh, the same uh, the same services or very near to each other and some of them never speak about uh, about website or web services and on the other hand they offer uh, uh, de detailed um, mobile apps for instance facebook um, publish uh, mobile apps on parallel with uh, their own website with very near services. Uh, we can speak about Opera, for instance. We don't, we don't have a website for that. We don't have a web application for that. But we have a big mobile app. What uh, so let me answer two things. One is I would, I would definitely contend that uh, Facebook with their mobile app is definitely not at all the same thing as their website in many different ways. You know, we talked about Messenger, we talked about some functionalities and so on. So it's a very different experience in reality on mobile mobile website and mobile app. And to me, if you want my short answer on that, is that's a very stupid thing to have a mobile app which looks like a website. You know, that's what people do when they have not understood at all what a mobile app is. Because if, if what you do is uh, think that a mobile app cannot be better or more things on a mobile website, then you have completely missed what mobile is about, right? And hopefully one of the things I try to say here is that, uh, yes, there are some constraints with mobile apps, 
but there, and we haven't talked too much, I agree about that, but there are plenty and plenty and plenty of uh, things you can do with a mobile app that you will never be able to do with a website, right? Uh, you know, we talked about the way you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, get push notifications, you can get, uh, you know, native uh, UI, you can get uh, actually a lot of uh, uh, engagement with users, you can get connections. I mean, there are plenty of services you can get uh, on mobile apps that are going to be either very, very hard or impossible to do with a website. And the real question is, to me, is, you know, what kind of service can you deliver to a to a customer with a mobile app, and uh, and what kind of uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, access can you give with a mobile website? So mobile website for somebody who looks for you or look for information uh, and finds you, you know, that's a very good way to to capture and attract customers. But for reuse, for uh, for engagement, for having people kind of uh, doing things and acting on things on a regular basis, nothing beats a mobile app. And there, again, the real question I think you have to answer is, you know, what do you want to deliver? with your mobile app as a service to your customers. And if you look at it from a service point of view, uh, you're gonna find ways to develop your mobile app, which are very different ways from your mobile website, which is gonna have again, in the whole customer journey, a very different role, a very different role than, uh, than, uh, than your mobile app. And if you look at most of the big, big players, whether it's Facebook or whether it's uh, LinkedIn, whether it's even Twitter and so on, their mobile apps, even in, if in their case there are a lot of commonalities between both, their mobile, their mobile website is just a jump or a way for them to uh, send you over to their, uh, to their mobile app. Uh, you know, take uh, uh, LinkedIn, for instance. LinkedIn is a very good example. LinkedIn, if you receive a mail and you click uh, accept on, a, on, a, on an invitation, it tries to send you directly to their mobile app, and there is a reason for that. And they know that uh, what they want to do with you is have you use their mobile app, not their mobile website. Yeah, a very down-to-earth question now. <laughs> okay. Um, is there a real impact of um, when, when you choose between native app uh, development and uh, multi-platform development, is there a real impact in the cost? Because, okay, cost is not so important, as you said, but when you need to budget it, you need to know whether the cost for one, one multi-platform uh, application will be twice uh, the price of uh, two uh, native application developments. Yeah, so, so maybe to clarify what I said, I, I didn't say that cost is not important, right? The cost is super important to every one of us, right? So, of course, of course, that's something you need to, to care about. What, what I try to say is that it's not by uh, saying, you know, if you look at my previous slide, right, which is this one, uh, yeah, here, uh, you know, by going down the scale, you know, you, you can uh, uh, basically uh, make sure that you... Uh, uh, you reuse as much code as you want, right? So uh, you can use, you can reuse a lot of the code, right? In uh, in these hybrid solutions, the problem is uh, uh, what what is the cost for reusing the code, right? And the cost for reusing the code, there is a lot of hidden cost, right? So you say, hey, you know, of course, I I code it only once, and I have two platforms, you know, so that kind of check, right? But the real the real impact is what is the impact in terms of UI? What is the impact in terms of performance? So there are additional costs. They just don't show up directly in the uh, in the equation here. They show up in terms of uh, additional effort you're going to have to uh, to do to uh, maybe improve your your uh, user uh, interface later on, because people are going to tell you it's not a good user interface. Um, you're going to have to uh, to acquire a new customer because some customers are going to be pissed off and they're going to deinstall your app because they think it's not performing uh, as well as other native apps. Uh, so there are a lot of hidden costs and. Again, if you look down the uh, the scale, you're going to say, well, then I'm not going to do 100% code we use. I'm going to do some specific uh, code for each app, right? which some of these platforms allow you to do. But then you're back into the discussion of going, well, then I do uh, something specific for iOS, something specific to our Android. And then you're kind of going backwards in terms of uh, I take one code and then we use it uh, across all platforms. So the what I'm saying, I guess, is if you do a total cost Again, direct cost and hidden cost, and you do the total at the end of the day, whether you're doing full native or full hybrid or anywhere in between, in reality, the difference in terms of cost is not as uh, as big as you might think it is initially. Does that make sense? I, I'd say 
in my experience, the most you can save is probably 20%, not more. Again, if you take all the hidden costs, right? And sometimes it might cost you more going hybrid. Because, because again, if your app is a, is a failure because people look at your app and say, Pah, you know, it's a shit, it's a piece of, oh, forgive my French. Um, uh, if they look at that, right, you know, the, the, the shitload of money you spend to acquire them and, uh, and engage them and so on is going to be thrown through the window, right? So it's like, so that's why I'm saying it's, that's why, you know, when I look at that, my take again is I say, don't even think about uh, making it a budget discussion, right? Make it, uh, make it a resource discussion because that's at least something that, uh, you know, you have, you have some control over and you have uh, some good reasoning for why you would choose one over the other. Because again, if uh, the only things that you have as developers uh, are uh, people in C-sharp, for instance, you know, capable on C-sharp, go for Xamarin, right? And you know, you're gonna be, uh, you're gonna be uh, having a good solution, and then you can, uh, you can uh, find ways to, uh, to optimize your app for iOS, for Android. Uh, what? Oh, okay, before the bomb goes out, I finish, but uh, I'll be more than happy to talk to each and every one of you. I'll be staying at the bar, so if you wanna join me there, I'll be more than happy. Thanks so much. Hey, 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 hey,